this is co-chair Ruth Richardson. Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call this remote meeting of the Select Committee on Racial Justice to order. I'd like to verify with staff that we have a quorum present. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Thank you, Alyssa. Members, the co-chairs and vice chair would like to welcome you to the select committee and make a few opening remarks. First, thank you to the members who accepted the invitation to join the committee and we appreciate you making this a priority. I want to acknowledge that this work and a focus on racial justice is long overdue. 2020 has shined a bright light on racial inequities in our communities and in our systems. The COVID-19 pandemic and the tragic death of George Floyd were catalysts for House Resolution 1 declaring racism a public health crisis. But we know that the public health crisis did not begin in 2020. We are grappling with centuries of systemic racism. While we know we cannot undo over 400 years of systemic racism in a single committee, this committee is an important first step forward. It is an acknowledgement that racism exists, that it is systemic, and that racism is harmful. It is an acknowledgement that racism is deadly and has an impact on life expectancy. It is an acknowledgement that we need an intersectional approach to racial justice. It is an acknowledgement that racism is costly and is impacting commerce adversely. It is also an acknowledgement that as long as racism exists, we're not living up to the promise of equality and not everyone is afforded an equitable opportunity to thrive and prosper. In order to make progress, we must acknowledge a problem exists. We must have difficult conversations and recognize the conversations are difficult because something is deeply wrong. We must also engage with the community, including engaging with black, indigenous and people of color who are closest to the pain of these complex issues. In the coming weeks, we'll have a series of informational hearings on racism to learn from data-driven experts. Instead of a little time for public testimony at each hearing, we're dedicating an entire hearing on October 13th for public test testimony, and that'll be an opportunity for the public to share personal experiences and recommendations as well. We also anticipate that the committee will develop a set of recommendations as well. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Vice Chair Damon. Thank you, Chair Richardson. And also thank you to Co-Chair Moran. It's my honor to serve as Vice Chair of this committee. When House Resolution 1 declaring racism as a public health crisis was passed in July during our second special session, it opened the opportunity to bring understanding and to identify areas of disparity and, and advance equity. Healthcare access and healthcare outcomes and our achievement gap in our state's educational system are two of the many areas that will be analyzed. Working in a collaborative and bipartisan way will move our state forward to benefit all Minnesotans. I'm looking forward to working with this committee, the members, as we tackle this difficult yet very important topic. Minnesota has moved to a national spotlight, and I believe now is the time for us to lead with positive and sustainable solutions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Danath. Representative uh, Co-Chair Moran. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is um, an honor to be here um, and to co-chair this select committee. I want to just personally say how grateful I am for everyone who was present today who volunteered to be a part of this select committee. That means a lot. All right. I just want to state that, you know, a select committee on racism, looking at racial justice within our healthcare system, in all our systems, um, is, is not an easy fit, a feat. And it's going to be a quite heavy subject area. So I just want to say that, that we recognize that this is not an easy subject for some people to talk about, to learn about, to hear about, um, and to acknowledge maybe in some ways. Um, but 
Um, but for many of us, this is a reality that has been a part of our lives for generations. And so it is really is a great opportunity for each one of us to all learn and grow in, from the information that we may hear. I want us to be open to that learning, you know? As legislators, I recognized early in this process that I did not, do not know everything. And some of my best work have come from listening to others. And so this is that same type of opportunity that we have at this moment is to learn and hear and be engaged with the presenters that we have uh, worked so hard as a team to put before this select committee. Uh, and so I want to also state that the pandemic, um, COVID-19, has lifted inequities that we see within our healthcare system and within so many of our other systems. But it's also created kind of like an opportunity here that we our legislators are doing our hearing, that we found the uh, outlet and a possibility in a way to still carry on the business of the house by doing our business through Zoom. It also created an opportunity for so many who otherwise would not have been engaged in this legislative process to be engaged in this legislative process. And so I'm gonna ask everyone a favor because for me, this subject area is really as personal. It's personal to me as a mother, uh, as a grandmother, and more important, uh, personal for me as a black mother and a black grandmother. And so I want us to be engaged in this process. So I'm gonna ask a favor from everyone, that if you are not driving or in any way compromising yourself, I really would like to see your face. And um, so if at all possible, please turn your camera on so that we can see you. More importantly, so that the public can see you and know you and learn who you, who we are. Because believe it or not, they don't always know that. So this is a great opportunity. So I, I know uh, Representative Heather says she's uh, she's in um, doing some work right now where she cannot be present on her camera. But if you can, please turn on your camera. Uh, that would be helpful. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Co-Chair Ruth Richardson, who will be chairing uh, today's um, select committee hearing. Thank you, Co-Chair Moran, and also Vice Chair Dana for your opening statements. Members, we like to go around and have each member state their name, district number, and the areas they represent. And then please call on another member of the committee to do the same. Because we're on a tight uh, schedule with our testifiers, please keep that introduction to no more than 30 seconds. As I stated earlier, I'm Rep. Ruth Richardson. I represent District 52B, which includes Mendota Heights, parts of Egan, Invergrove Heights, and Sunfish Lake. With that, I will call on Vice Chair uh, Damoth. Thank you. I'm Representative Lisa Damoth. I live in Cold Spring, and I represent the communities of Cold Spring, Rockville, Richmond, St. Joseph, Painesville, Kimball, Stearns County portion of Eden Valley, Avon, and St. Joseph. Um, I also represent a number of the townships in the surrounding area. And with that, I would like to call on uh, Rep. Sandell. If you would unmute yourself, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Steve Sandell. I represent District 53B. That's uh, most of Woodbury in the southeast uh, corner of the metropolitan area. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you and an honor as well. I'd like to introduce um, uh, my panel of the legislature from uh, another corner of the state, Representative Rod Eklund from International Falls. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Representative Rob Eklund. I represent District 3A in Northeastern Minnesota. Those of you that can name all the cities that you represent off the top of your uh, hand are, I, I, I are great. I, I, I call it by counties. So I represent Cooching County, Northeast St. Louis County, Mosto Lake County, and Olive Cook County. So I like to say without uh, my district, Minnesota wouldn't have a point. But anyway, I'd like to introduce Representative New. Good afternoon. I'm Representative Ann New. I serve most of Chisago County, 
so uh, the cities that people would know, Taylor's Falls, Lindstrom, Wyoming, North Branch, lots of townships and, and others in between. Uh, and I will go in order on my screen here. Let's see here, Representative Moran. Thank you. So I am Representative Rena Moran. I represent District 65A, which includes the historical Rondo community, Charlestown, Midway, a little part of the North End here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and a little part of Cathedral Hill. And I will pass it on to Representative Hearn. Uh, hello, I'm State Representative Kali Her, 64A in St. Paul. I represent the neighborhoods of Summit Hill, Corocus Hill, Mac Groveland, Summit, uh, Summit University, um, Union Park, Merriam Park, and South St. Anthony Park. And I will call on colleague Representative Dean Ertle. I'm uh, Representative Dean Erdahl. I represent District 18A. It includes all of Meeker County, the largest uh, city being uh, Litchfield. Uh, I do represent uh, the other half of Eden Valley. Uh, Representative Damoth has the north, I have the south. Uh, I have um, three town county, including half of the uh, city of Hutchinson. The other half I share with Representative and uh, then I have one township in Wright County, uh, Cocado, Cocado Township. And I guess, uh, let's see, Representative Lehman, I'll go to you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Dean Erdahl. Um, I'm Representative Sandy Lehman, and I represent much of Itasca County and Cass Counties. Um, and um, you might be familiar with Grand Rapids uh, area. That's kind of my home base, Grand Rapids Cohasset. Um, kind of in the in the geography of the state, I'm south of Rob Eklund. <laughs> so I think we're kind of holding down the north end there, Rob. Um, and with that, uh, I'm looking over at Representative Cagle. Oh, I'm um, Representative Erin Cagle. I um, represent part of the um, North Metro, which is Blaine, Coon Rapids, Spring Lake Park area. I have half of all the cities, but not... I don't have a whole of any of the cities, so that's fun. Um, and I will, I'll go with Heather Heather Edelson since she doesn't have her uh, her screen up. I don't want her to get left out. Sorry, Jamie. Hi, thank you. Sorry, all I would be present, but my mom is in the middle of moving, and I'm I'm trying to help while also be present. Um, so uh, Heather Edelson, I represent Edina, and it's an honor to be a part of this committee. I was really hoping to be selected, so um, feel very privileged to be on the committee, and look forward to our discussions. I'll go next. Oh, and then I have to call on somebody, right? Okay, hold on, let me see. I think I'm um, last, Heather. Oh, oh, Jamie, are you last? Well, good. Jamie, Representative Long, I call on you then. Uh, this is Representative Jamie Long, District 61B in Southwest Minneapolis, and I echo Heather's comments. It's a real honor to be a part of this committee. Thank you, members. Staffing our committee, we have committee administrators Laura Taken Holtze and Alyssa Fritz, uh, Fritz uh, committee legislative assistant Benta Conta, and nonpartisan House staff uh, research analyst Pat McCormick and Mary Mullen, as well as others who may join depending on the topic. I also want to recognize Republican researcher uh, Callie Lehman and DFL researcher Joe, uh, Joe Durham. Members, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones. I'd like to uh, say that we're going to save questions until we have the end of both uh, presentations. And we are very lucky today to have two highly regarded uh, speakers. And because we are on such a tight schedule, uh, I think I will just turn it over to Dr. Jones so that she has the ability to share her PowerPoint and get started. Thank you, Representative Richardson, and thank you all to the Select Committee. I, that was good, not just for the folks of Minnesota to know who their representatives are in, in the fullness of it on this committee, but for me, it makes me feel very at home uh, to share some of my work with you. I'm going to share my screen. And um, today, I understand I have. 30 minutes or so to share with you uh, some almost like uh, racism 101, social determinants of health 101, 
Health Equity 101. Um, so I, in recognizing that you all have declared racism to be a public health crisis, at least on the House side, entitled my testimony, Achieving Health Equity, Naming Racism and Moving to Action. I'm gonna start with a definition of health equity that is closely related to the Healthy People 2020 definition to which I contributed, but also differs in important ways. So this is a three-part definition. What is health equity? How do we get there? And how is health equity related to health disparities? I should say by way of introduction, and maybe you've seen a bio or not, that I am a family physician. I am a PhD epidemiologist. I'm a past president of the American Public Health Association. Uh, last year, I was uh, the 2019-2020 Evelyn Green Davis Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And I have taught at the Harvard School of Public Health, at Morehouse School of Medicine, at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, and spent 14 and a half years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So all of that work informs what I'm going to be sharing with you right now. Just so that you know who I am, like not just uh, Josephine Blow off the streets. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I, I thought you guys might be like, well, who is she to improve on the Healthy People 2020 definition? So like it's, it's coming from there. Um, so first of all, what is health equity? Well, health equity is assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. That's my definition of health equity. We, when we developed the Healthy People 2020 definition, asserted that health equity is attainment of the highest level of health for all people. And I still know that that is our goal, but what troubles me about that as a definition of health equity is what if we hit that last Sunday, are we done? And it became clear to me that health equity is not an outcome, that health equity is actually a process. And which process? Assurance which is actually one of the three core functions of public health that were identified by the Institute of Medicine when it was the Institute of Medicine, not the National Academy of Medicine. But a long time ago, assurance along with assessment and policy development are the three core functions of public health. And assurance of what? Of the conditions for optimal health, which now you'll hear people talking about as the social determinants of health. And when they say that thing, social determinants of health, what do we mean? We mean those determinants of health and illness that are outside of the individual, beyond our individual genes and beyond our individual behaviors. These are the context of our lives. And health equity is assurance of those conditions for optimal health for whom? For all people, that's what makes it equity. How do we get there? Well, achieving health equity requires at least these three things, valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and providing resources according to need. So you value all individuals and populations equally, but if you value them equally, then you provide resources according to need. Just as if you love your children equally, but you don't give them all the same size bike or all of the same anything, right? And actually, I think that these three principles for achieving health equity, if you're trying to figure out, is the resolution that we're about to pass, you know, or the law that's about to be implemented, is it about health equity? It should address all three of these things. And really, when I think about it, Providing resources according to need is the place where you start because when you do that, then you are recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. And when you recognize and recognize, recognize and rectify historical injustices, that is one way of valuing all individuals and populations equally. There are many ways. Think about the word value. When you value somebody, then you invest in them, you protect them, you cherish them, you celebrate them, you listen to them and invite their opinions. So, I mean, we could between the 22 of us, we could generate 100 words for valuing. But anyway, this is a little long on that point, just to say that if you want to say, are we doing health equity, you should be doing these three things. And then how is health equity related to health disparities? Well, health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. Health disparities are the differences in outcome that we see, the differences in the impact of you know, uh, COVID-19, 
disproportionately on communities of color, on Black and Indigenous and Latinx and Pacific Islander and other communities of color. The difference is in the numbers of our babies dying before their first birthday or the numbers of our women dying in, within a year of a pregnancy. So those are the outcomes. Health equity is all the stuff about opportunity, exposure to risk or protection from risk, all of the stuff that came before. This is our setting. So now we enter, when we start recognizing racial ethnic health disparities, that's how we enter the health equity conversation with understanding racism. When I was president of the American Public Health Association four years ago in 2016, I launched our association and as many other partners in our state affiliates and other organizations, communities, everybody as would join us on a national campaign against racism with three tasks. The first, to name racism, because if we never say the word racism in the context of widespread denial, which is our national context, then we're complicit with that denial. So it's so important to name racism. It's so important that HR1 said that racism is a public health crisis, putting you all firmly on record, acknowledging, first of all, that racism exists and that it's a problem. But then once we name racism, that's the first necessary step, but it is insufficient. We must go beyond that to ask the question, how is racism operating here in my jurisdiction, in my child's school, in my workplace, with regard to police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women, with regard to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. And I'm going to go more deeply into that, but what we're doing, I'm going to give you tools actually to examine how is racism operating here, looking at elements of decision-making, which would then allow us to identify levers for intervention, targets for action, and then we need to organize and strategize to act. The legislature, you guys, of course, have a lot of power, but we, there has to always be community involvement and all kinds of groups and you know everybody coming together, organizing and strategizing to act. And I recognize that Minnesota is one of the four states, 25 counties, and so there are three, I think, in, well, I don't know how many cities and counties, there are four jurisdictions in your state and then three others, but there are four states in the country, last time I looked about a month, uh, not a month ago, a week ago, four states, 25 counties, and 61 cities that have made similar declarations that racism is a public health crisis. Very important. Now, to get the Minnesota Senate to join in, to get the governor to sign this, to get everybody in Minnesota, to get everybody in those other states that are not yet in red to join in, we, there are four key messages. The first is that racism exists. I'm going to give you a story to help you even talk to your family members. I hope that you'll remember. I'm going to share two stories with you today. And I hope that you'll remember these stories, share them with your family members, share them with people, you know, um, in your district if you can. You know, I can tell you how to do that. But that racism exists. The second of four key messages is that racism is a system, not an individual character flaw or personal moral, moral failing. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that we can act to dismantle racism and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potential. So the rest of my talk is going to be to give you just snapshots of things um, to help equip you to convincingly understand and convey these key messages. The first tool to help us understand that racism exists is actually one of my teaching stories, my allegories on issues of race and racism that I often deploy. I mean, that's, if I would say my superpower is to break down complex issues in terms of allegories that have been sparked by something that I saw with my own real eyes. So I call this allegory dual reality, a restaurant saga, and it was sparked by my experience as a first year medical student. And I've already told you the moral of the stories that racism exists. So this is what happened to me. As a first year medical student, of course, I was very studious, you know, uh, very diligent. So I wake up early on a Saturday morning and my job on that Saturday is to hit the books. So I'm hitting the books, studying hard. It gets to be about afternoon and some friends come over. And do they distract me? 
No, all of us get together studying long and hard, and now it's getting late, and we're getting hungry, and I have no food in the apartment, which was quite typical of me. So my friends understood. They said, never mind, Kamara. Let's go into town and find something to eat. So we do. We go into town and we find a restaurant and we walk in and we sit down and the menus are presented and we order our food and the food is served. And here we are eating not a very illuminating story about racism yet. But as I sat there eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign. And that sign was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now I've intrigued you. And you're wondering, first of all, where did you go to medical school? And second of all, what did the sign say? Well, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost many of you. So let me recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating. I look across the room. I see a sign that says open. If I hadn't thought anything more about it, I would have assumed that other hungry people could walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that now, in fact, the restaurant was closed due to the hour, but that it was firmly closed and that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign, would not be able to come and sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I recognized that racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it's difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So, for example, it is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. In fact, it's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context. But those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims clothes to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant, to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, well, you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is, after all, inside with you. And you could say, restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door again? Let them come in. You will make more money and oh, the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass me through the window. Or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign or break through the door. But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat. Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So I tell this story when I just have four minutes to share with people that, yes, racism exists, that it's creating a two-sided or multi-sided sign in our society, creating a dual or multifaceted reality. And in fact, racism is not just the sign, it's the sign, it's the door, it's the lock, all of it. And actually for people, I, I started a three-hour conversation once with this one question. So I'm going to throw the question out to you, but we're not going to talk about it for three hours right now. But the question I asked once in a community setting was how could people who are born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign? And it was a three-hour conversation because actually there are many ways to know. But what I have to say right now is I'm heartened that over these past five to six months, more people who were born inside the restaurant have gotten a glimpse of the fact that it's a two-sided sign going on, that it says open to them, but closed on the other side. More people are naming racism as you all have a hot, as a you know, state house have done. And people are you know, putting together the words structural racism, systemic racism. More people are affirming that black lives matter as opposed to saying, what are those people saying outside? Don't they know all lives matter? So more people are getting a sense of that. But my warning is that the, the baseline positioning in our nation of racism denial, that staunch racism denial, 
is so seductive that if we just say a thing, six months from now, we may forget why we said that thing. We might fall back into what I'm describing as the sleepiness or somnolence of racism denial. So it is important to act. It's important to say a thing. That's important. We have to name racism. It is necessary, but insufficient. What we need to do is start tearing down the sign, dismantling the lock, take the door off the hinges. We must act because if we start acting, we will not forget why we are acting. I'm going to quickly then share with you my definition of racism. I'm going to share it with you as one sentence and then go up back and pick up on four important parts of this definition. So when I say, when I talk about racism at all, I'm talking about a system, a system of doing what? A system of structuring opportunity and assigning value. And on what basis? Based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race in this country. What are the impacts of this system? Well, racism unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, excuse me, some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. I often talk deeply into each section of that, but realizing that I have a limited amount of time, I wanted you to see the whole definition and then just pick up the most Four, four most important parts of this definition. First of all, we have to recognize that racism is a system. It's not an individual character flaw. It's not a personal moral failing. It is not even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested, although it can manifest itself in all of those ways. But in its essence, it's a system of power. This system does two things. It structures opportunity and it assigns value. The basis of that opportunity structuring and Value assignment is so-called race, the social interpretation of how one looks, because we must understand that race is not biology, it's not even culture, it is not social class, although there is an association between race and social class in this country because of structural racism. I'm going to go into that in just a minute. But race is just the on-the-street classification of people without somebody asking, excuse me, how do you self-identify? Or excuse me, where were you born? Where were your parents born? Or even, excuse me, may I have a little bit of your blood? I have a genetic hypothesis. And it is that socially assigned race that has had, it's the substrate on which racism operates both historically and today to structure opportunity and assign value. The fourth important point is that racism has three impacts. If you ask most people, what does racism do? They'll say, okay, if I understand racism, it says, yeah, it unfairly disadvantages some, but every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, which is, um, we hardly ever talk about in this country, the you know, unearned white privilege. We hardly ever talk about that because it makes some people, especially some people who are living as white, uncomfortable. And I say living as white because we understand that, that race is the social interpretation of how one looks. And I have used, in the past, I have said, if I just made somebody uncomfortable by saying that racism unfairly advantages other individuals and, com and communities, if I've made somebody uncomfortable by talking about unearned white privilege, I used to say, please shake it off, stay with me, I'm gonna tell you more stories. I don't say that anymore. Because I have come to learn that for all of us, for me and for all of us, the edge of our comfort is our growing edge. So I say, if you feel uncomfortable, I invite you to lean into that discomfort because that is all of our growing edge. But the third thing is that racism is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And whether we are constraining you know, black and indigenous and other people of color lives slowly by, by not vigorously investing in the full excellent public education of all of our kids, because you know, the blinders of some decision makers have made them believe there's no genius in the barrios or the ghettos or in the reservations or you know, in the resettlement areas. Or if we're slowly constraining you know, the, the brilliance and the leadership and the, and the you know, creativity and the love and all of that of black and brown and, and indigenous peoples by being complacent with the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system, or whether it's in a moment with a police officer's gun or a police officer's knee, that is not just affecting the life that's been lost, the brilliance that's been gone, or the, the family that is fractured forever, or even the communities who are just bracing ourselves for the next occurrence. This represents 
sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Just one more thing I need to say, and I know I, I, I don't want to eat up all of my time, but there are people in this country, many people, I'd say most people in this country who think they're two states of being, disadvantaged and normal. And the reason that people think there's disadvantaged and normal is that we as a nation are ahistorical. And so people do not understand that their so-called normal is built up on a whole mountain of unfair advantage. I would love to engage with you all on questions on that. Very quickly, because I'm a public health person and I hear that you all have a lot of interest in health as well as of course in education and, and you know, uh, the justice system and housing and all of that. But as a physician, I try to figure out how could racism turn into health outcomes and what can we do about it? So I described three levels of racism, institutionalized or structural, personally mediated and internalized. So I'd like to just quickly define each of these, give you very quickly some examples of how they can impact health and other aspects of life, and then illustrate them with my, uh, another of my teaching stories, my Gardner Hill allegory. Institutionalized or structural racism, it's the same thing. I use the terms interchangeably now. I, the paper on which this is based was published 20 years ago. I've been telling this story and this framework for 30 years. This is how old this struggle has been. But institutionalized structural racism is the system, if you will, the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, which taken together result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that does not require an identifiable perpetrator because it's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms. This is the kind of racism that shows up as inherited disadvantage or as reciprocal inherited advantage. And we see it in terms of material conditions as well as in terms of access to power. So differential access to quality housing, ed excellent educational opportunities, equal employment opportunities, the same level of income at the same level of employment by race. Clearly, those things impact health. Differential access to medical facilities, not just you know proximity access, but insurance access or linguistic access. Differential access to a clean environment and a very well documented disproportionate placement of toxic dump sites or bus transfer stations in communities of color. These are all examples of how institutionalized or structural racism manifests in our material conditions. In terms of power, differential access to information, which could be health information or even information about our own histories. Differential access to resources, not just capital resources, but social networking resources and knowing somebody on the board. Differential access to voice in media, voice in government and the like. Although I can't dwell on this point, often I am asked, look at that top set of examples where you talk about housing, education, employment, income. Dr. Jones, isn't that what we call social class? Are you talking about racism? Like, why do you have that on a slide about racism? Are you really talking about racism? Are you actually talking about social class? That's a very important question. The, the, the telegraphic answer is that it does not just so happen that marginalized, you know, that people of color, for example, are rep overrepresented in poverty while white people are overrepresented in wealth in this nation. That's not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized or stigmatized or oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical injustice. I usually go through a litany of about six or eight of them. I would just say that for, for indigenous people in this country, the initial historical injustice was the taking of the land, the near genocide, and then moving survivors to reserve lands. And often, and there's something good found under one reservation, oops, you have to pick the people up and move them somewhere else. For people of African descent, it started with the you know, kidnapping of West African people, our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage, and then for their survivors and their progeny for generations, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country. But then when people hear me talking about that, they say, Dr. Jones, you know, there you go talking about slavery. Dr. Jones, we all recognize that slavery was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history. But Dr. Jones, the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865, and we are now in 2020. That makes that 155 years ago, Dr. Jones, all else being equal, don't you think the impact of slavery would have washed out by now? But the key phrase is in the question, all else being equal. And all else has not been equal since 1865. All else still is not equal today. And there are present day contemporary structural factors perpetuating that injustice and all the other injustices that I did not have the time to litanize for you. And these present day contemporary structural factors are part and parcel of institutionalized or structural racism. So when you ask me, 
am I talking about racism or am I really talking about social class? My response is that structural racism explains why we even see an association between social class and race in this country. I could talk so more onto this slide, but I'm not going to. I just need to say that structural racism can be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing, acts of commission as well as acts of omission. And very often, structural racism shows up as lack of action, inaction in the face of need. The second level of racism, personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. This is what most people think of when they hear the word racism, that somebody did something to somebody, and includes the different idea, which is the prejudice, and the different action, which is the discrimination. Many ways that this can impact health. I know I don't have to talk to you guys about police brutality, physician disrespect, shopkeeper vigilance, waiter indifference, teacher devaluation, I wish I could go into more detail in each of these, but each of these where assumptions are made about people's intent or people's ability to follow a physician's recommendation, all of these things, or even when a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn and puts them off in the attention deficit disorder track where that child will never even know their full potential, much less develop to their full potential. All of these things can impact health and well-being. Um, like institutionalized or structural racism, this level can also be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing. But even more important is to recognize that this level of racism can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism, internalized racism, I define here from the point of view of members of stigmatized races as acceptance by members of stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. It shows up as self-devaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as, maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or apply to that college or try to run for that office or live in that neighborhood. White man's ice is colder syndrome. From my parents' generation, what it might mean is that if I am black, maybe I, and I need a lawyer, I might seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer. Or if my lemonade were warm, I might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder. It turns into resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors. Sometimes it's manifested as not even registering to vote. We're not voting even if we are registered. And I, I know that all of you all as elected officials are trying to push everybody to vote, that there be no limitations to citizens voting. It's really about members of stigmatized races accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. So I'm very quickly going to share with you uh, my Gardner's Tale allegory. I'm going to stop sharing um, just to um, so that I can be big on your screen. And then when I finish sharing the Gardner's Tale, I'm going to go back and share at least one slide. There were other things I wanted to to also share, but I, I recognize that I've sort of been eating into my time. So after the Gardner's Tale, I'll go back and share one more thing, and then you all can tell me if you want uh, four more minutes of, of stuff. Okay. So, so this allegory, has is I, it's based on my own real life experience. So first, let me tell you what happened in my life, and then I'm going to make it a story about racism and, you know, illustrating these three levels and telling us what can we do. So my husband and I have been married for about a year when we moved back down to Baltimore for me to finish my PhD at Hopkins. We bought our first freestanding house, cute little house with a big wraparound porch with flower boxes dotted all on the porch. And we bought the house in October, not really the time to plant in Baltimore, so we waited. But when spring came, my husband, who loves to garden, ran out with our marigold seeds, gonna decorate our cute little house. But then he came right back in, he said, Kamara, some of these boxes have dirt in them, but some of these boxes are empty. I need to go down to the gardening store. So he does. He goes to the gardening store and he hauls back big old bags of potting soil. And then we fill up those empty boxes. Then we take equal numbers of our marigold seeds and you plant them in the boxes and we water each of the boxes equally. And then because I'm not the gardener in the family, I'm exhausted. So I'm just going to sit back and be delighted. Well, three weeks later, I walk out of my front door onto my porch and I finally pay attention to these flower boxes and what I saw made me literally stop in my tracks because what I saw made me think that we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus the others because some of the boxes were full of plants and they were tall, vigorous looking plants. And some of the boxes just had a few plants in them and they were kind of scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. 
that potting soil that my husband had bought turned out to be rich, fertile soil, so that every single seed planted in the potting soil had sprouted. The strong seed had grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. But that old soil that we had found there in those boxes turned out to be poor, rocky soil. So the weak seed plant in the poor, rocky soil just died. But even the strong seed in that poor, rocky soil struggled to make it to a middling height. And some of you guys, I'm not looking at you right now, so maybe you're nodding, maybe you're gardeners, maybe you have composted half of your garden, and maybe you've seen this image with your own real eyes. The image, of course, is about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm going to take this image and I'm going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms, and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms. And the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed, puts it in the rich, fertile soil, pink seed in the poor, rocky soil. And three weeks later in her flower boxes, she sees what I saw in mine. In that rich, fertile soil, all the red seed sprouts, strong red seed grows tall and vigorous, and even the weak red seed makes it halfway up. In the poor, rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes a strong pink seed struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. And then the next year, the same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year, the same thing happens. And then finally, about 10 years later, Garden is looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we interrupt the story there to say that the first part of this story illustrates how institutionalized or structural racism works, where you have the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil, the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes, keeping the soil separate, and then through inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. But let's pick the story back up and say, well, where is personally mediated racism in the garden? Well, the gardener's looking over at the red flowers thinking, oh, red is so beautiful. And then she looks at the pink flowers and she says, oh, those pink flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil. So she plucks it out before it can establish itself which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not acknowledging or perhaps not even understanding that they're benefiting from enriched soil. The pink flowers are looking over at red, thinking red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees, minding their own business, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee into one of the pink flowers, and then to another pink flower, and to this pink flower, this flower is like, get away from me, bee, don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red, because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start by addressing the internalized racism. We could go over to the pink flowers and we could say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is an important intervention. But if that's all we do, it's not going to change the situation in which those pink flowers find themselves. So you might say, okay, well, let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's have a conversation with the gardener or better yet, a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. So we do that. And in our workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. If we really want to set things right in this garden, we must address the structural or institutionalized racism. We have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's all right too, although it makes it easier for that same gardener to continue segregating resources going forward. But if you keep separate boxes, it means you must enrich that poor rocky soil until it is as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish and be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious so that in that intervention on the structural racism, you will also address the internalized racism because pink will no longer be looking over at red, thinking that it's better or wanting to be red. And in that intervention, you may also address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink, but her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful will be less likely to have that kind of attitude. So this story has been to illustrate these three levels of racism to strongly suggest that if we want to set things right in the garden, we must at least address the structural or institutionalized racism, um, but good to address all the levels at the same time. And when we, and, and when we do, you know, when we address the structural, the other levels may take care of themselves. I just have one more question that I need to um, raise for you all. And then I think I must stop. I had some other important things that you can ask me about as a question. But here's a very important question. Who is the gardener? This is the crux of the question, in fact. Who is the gardener? Because the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide 
the power to act and control of resources, which are actually the elements of self-determination. Who is the gardener? Well, in our system, in this country, government is a huge part of the, of the gardener. You guys, you guys are a huge part of the gardener. Not the only part, though, because media, foundations, corporations, communities, to the extent they have self-determination, but whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it is dangerous when she is not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful, thank you, because she is not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. So our challenge is what do we do about the gardener? Do we make the gardener striped or polka dotted or fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow and recruit their own gardener? Two, the last two questions, two things I'm gonna say are two questions that have come up to me before. The first was, Dr. Jones, why should the red flowers share their soil? When I heard this question, I loved the question because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism between you and me. You know, uh, that, you know conversations about racism that would be difficult if we were trying to talk about racism between you and me, because now we can talk about gardener and flower pots. So I encourage you guys to share this story widely in your networks. But my answer to that question, why should the red flowers share their soil? is that actually that soil does not belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. The second question, what if that's not the original gardener? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Here we are. And the great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the flowers looking like that, may not even think there's a problem to be solved. So very quickly, first of three parts, we must make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. It must be on the agenda. Part two, in order to solve it, we must make those flower boxes transparent. We must be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil. And part three, as we make those flower boxes transparent, we must make it absolutely clear to all that the pink seed did not just go launch themselves into that poor rocky soil. So we must talk about history and we must talk about how the gardener's initial preference for red over pink set up the whole situation. Some people call that, you know, cultural racism. In our context, it's white supremacist ideology. We must acknowledge and address that because if we don't, even if we were to compel the red gardener to enrich the poor rocky soil today until it is as rich as the rich fertile soil, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So when I defined racism as a system of two things, doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value, we must attend to both. So I am so sorry that I um, uh, had, you know, my, my eyes were bigger than my time, um, but if you want to ask me some other questions later, then I'd be happy to share some other ideas. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for sharing that information. And we are grateful that you're able to stay on for, for questions as well. Uh, really quickly, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Representative Becker Finn joined. Uh, Representative uh, Becker Finn, if you want to just quickly introduce yourself and say the cities that you, uh, that you represent. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Jamie Becker Finn, District 42B. Uh, I represent the cities of Little Canada, Vadness Heights, Gem Lake, and then parts of Roseville and Shoreview. And uh, Dr. Jones, that was uh, that was really great. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And we're now going to move along to Dr. Hardiman, and we will give her the ability to be able to share her screen. She'll go until about 1.30, uh, and then we will open it up uh, for questions for both Dr. Jones and Dr. Hardiman. Dr. Hardiman, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I'm just going to swap, swap displays really quickly. So that, all right, does that look... Does that look okay? All yes, right. it's coming through clearly. Thank you. Yes, except it shows your next slide. So you want to swap it the oh, other it's, it's showing. Yeah. I thought I had uh, done it the other way. Okay, let's try this. Okay, that's good. There you go. That's good. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Jones. So thank you, um, Representative Richardson and uh, Representative uh, Moran for having me uh, today. I'm, I'm honored to be here, particularly as a native Minnesotan um, and a um, 
resident of District 46A. Um, also, I want to thank Dr. Jones, um, who has certainly paved the way for my scholarship. If, if it weren't for Dr. Jones, I would not be doing the work that I do. So it's an honor to share space with, with you today as well, um, particularly as it relates to my, um, my home. Um, in a place I, I care deeply about. So I was asked to offer some specific examples of exactly what um, Dr. Jones has shared with us around um, racism and sort of laid out those definitions. And so my task today is to spend a little bit of time um, really highlighting for folks um, the ways that racism and social determinants of health manifest in real life um, health consequences with a focus on um, health consequences for moms and babies. So let's see, oh, there we go. So I'm going to start with um, some, some background before digging in. And I will say now, um, I tried not to be too data heavy. On, um, often I'm actually tasked with giving the talk that Dr. Jones just gave along with explaining sort of the maternal mortality um, and infant mortality piece of putting those both together. So it's great to not have to do the, the racism 101 part and just focus on um, how it's manifesting and health outcomes. Um, so I'm gonna start with just a little bit of background on maternal and infant mortality so that we're all on the same page about sort of what we're facing um, as a country and certainly as a state as well. So maternal mortality, um, just to be clear, refers to a death that occurs during pregnancy um, or within one year postpartum from um, a pregnancy complication or a chain of events initiated by pregnancy or the aggravation of an unrelated um, condition by the physiological um, of, or physiologic effects of pregnancy. Um, and what we know is that each year in the United States, 700 to 900 women die of pregnancy-related causes, which makes the United States the only developed country in the world with the highest and increasing maternal mortality rate. And we also know that the risk for maternal mortality and morbidity is unevenly distributed, with some people and populations bearing a substantially greater risk. So among the groups at higher risk um, across the United States are, are, black, are black birthing people and indigenous birthing people. And what we see is that black women in particular are three to four times more likely to die of a pregnancy related cause than their non-Hispanic white um, counterparts. And this statistic, um, uh, continues to persist despite education level and socioeconomic status, despite access to prenatal care, which suggests that there's some other things happening or underlying um, what's happening in this space. Some of you may be more familiar with the infant mortality um, data. We have been collecting infant mortality um, data for um, a very, very long time now. And what we know is that infant mortality rates or the disparities by race and infant mortality um, have persisted for as long as we've collected that data. So um, white infant death rates overall um, have declined since the 19th century. Um, but the disparity between black and white infant deaths today is actually greater than it was under antebellum slavery. Um, some historical demographers have actually estimated that in 1850, enslaved infants died um, for one year of age at a rate that was 1.6 times higher than that of white infants. And in comparison, the CDC and um, figures from 2016 indicate that today in non-Hispanic black infant mortality is 2.3 times higher than that of um, non-Hispanic white babies. And here in Minnesota, we're certainly grappling with racial disparities in infant mortality where we see that black and indigenous babies are twice as likely to die in that first year of life. So we've already learned from Dr. Jones that the root cause of the racial inequities that we're experiencing in, um, in health outcomes is racism. And I always like to include this um, important statement from Dr. Joya Creer Perry, who's the founder of the National Birth Equity Collaborative, um, in which she says race isn't a risk factor in maternal and infant health, um, racism is. So again, we know, and so I'm not going to spend any time walking through sort of the definition of structural racism, but I think it's important to, um, to bring it up here just because it is an important part of what I'll talk about next in the data that I'm going to present. present. And in particular, I think this circular um, figure here is, is really important because I think as um, 
you know, as a community, as a population, we've become comfortable talking about implicit bias and we, you know, hear about unconscious or automatic biases and how they may, um, for instance, in healthcare impact the ways that um, a physician might um, interact with a black patient, or we've heard about implicit bias in policing and, um, and thinking about sort of ways to mitigate that. But I think it's also important to understand that um, learning about implicit bias is, is important, right? And that that neuroscience is incredibly important, but we have to learn about it within the context of structural racism and the fact that that, that they feed each other, right? And that, um, you know, implicit bias is certainly giving rise to um, to structural racism and perpetuating structural, structural racism in a lot of our systems and structures across our communities. And so as leaders, you know, we have to examine and unpack both our own biases, um, but also simultaneously be thinking about the ways to enact exactly what Dr. Jones described around, you know, dismantling the policies and structures that hold these inequities and these biases in place. So the premise of the evidence that I um, will share to uh, share with you today is that racism gets under the skin and impacts health. And so in order to make sure that we sort of all understand that on some, you know, on a very basic level, I suppose, um, given the time we have, I just want to put forth the weathering hypothesis for those who aren't um, as familiar with it. Um, and it's the idea that today's experiences and exposures um, influence tomorrow's health. Um, it's also um, the idea that context directly affects health. And by context, I mean the social determinants of health, where you live, work, and play. And that, you know, these in inequities um, in where we live, work, and play um, get under the skin and um, they impact the health and well-being across the life course. And so the health effects of these contextual factors are going to accumulate with age and they're going to age the body. And what we've seen by um, Dr. Geronimus is that, um, who put forth the, the weather hypothesis in the early 90s, is that, that that aging due to cumulative disadvantage due to racism gets under the skin and brings um, Black birthing people into pregnancy um, less healthy or at less optimal levels for, um, for a healthy uh, birth experience. So now I'm going to dig into the evidence. I think, you know, the evidence um, linking uh, racism to maternal health outcomes exists on a variety of different levels. So I'm going to start sort of um, start by zooming out to sort of the structural space and really thinking about how structural racism um, shows up sort of at a community and population health level to impact um, birth outcomes. And then we'll kind of zoom in on the healthcare delivery system and how we see it showing up there, because I think it's important to kind of understand both as we're thinking about what we do next. So these data, um, you know, come from a study that uh, I've been working on with some um, great colleagues at Tulane University, where we are asking the question, are, I mean, a simple, simple question of, are there associations between county level indicators of structural racism and maternal mortality among non-Hispanic black and white populations in the United States? And you know, using uh, vital records data, and I'm happy to get into the statistic, statistics and the analyses for folks who are interested, but I um, intentionally didn't sort of include um, uh, too much of that on, on the slides that I'll share today, just because it gets, um, it can kind of become a little bit tedious, but again, I'm happy to talk about um, the data sources and things like that. I'm in the Q&A se uh, session. Um, but what we did was operationalize um, county level structural racism indicators. Um, uh, so things like educate, looking at racial inequity and educational attainment, um, uh, racial inequity in employment and medium household income, and then also in prison and jail incarceration rates. Um, so looking at racial inequities and who's um, and, and prison, uh, prison stays as well as in jail, um, jail incarcerations. And then we also created an overall structural racism measure, which was a dichotomized variable of high and low structural racism um, and looked at that by county. And then um, we also leveraged the, uh, a measure called the index of, comp um, of concentration at the extremes where higher uh, scores indicate a larger concentration of high income residents to sort of give us an, an understanding or sort of a lens of what's happening um, depending on a different county with respect to maternal mortality um, disparities. And so, 
Um, you know, the answer, so the answer to our question, are there associations between county level uh, indicators of structural racism and maternal mor mortality by, um, by race, by black and white race? The answer is yes. Um, so what we see um, most importantly, and I know there's a lot of words on, these, on this slide, so I'll kind of highlight, I think the, the most important takeaway is that yes, um, structural racism is opera operationalized by racial inequity in household income and racial inequity in educational attainment. Um, we're associated with a 12 and 16% respect um, increase in overall maternal mortality. Um, we also see that for median household income, it was associated with a nearly 30% increase in black maternal mortality. We also note that county level prison incarceration was associated with a nearly 30% increase in black maternal mortality. Um, you know, we also, you know, I think it's important to also understand what's happening and not just to name sort of these inequities um, that are persisting, whether it's at the state, city, county level, but also um, for, you know, naming that, that for black, for black uh, communities is incredibly important, but also understanding what's happening in, um, with, the, with the white population in our sample as well. And so what we see is that structural racism in prison incarceration rates was associated with a 22% decrease in white maternal mortality in the counties that we examined. Um, we find that um, with respect to that index of the concentration of extremes, so looking at that income inequality that um, so that um, counties with a higher ICE score had a 20% lower overall maternal mortality, meaning that counties with a higher ICE score have a larger concentration of high income residents. So as we're thinking about sort of the inter intersections of um, socioeconomic status and, and racism, um, as Dr. Jones pointed out, I think that's an incredibly important finding. And then our measure of overall structural racism um, in the county was associated with a 37%, so a nearly 40% increase in black maternal mortality. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time as we think about sort of structural racism and how it's showing up to impact um, population health with, res with respect to maternal mortality. Um, um, you know, I think we, we can't have this discussion without understanding the new context of our lives, which is COVID-19. And I'm sure all of you at this point are incredibly familiar with the fact that, um, with the reality that um, COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting um, uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. So we have to be thinking about and ask ourselves the question of how will COVID-19 affect maternal health equity? And you know, I think there's there's many ways that um, that we're going to see this play out. Or we're starting to see it play out, and we'll continue to see this play out um, for several years. Um, you know, but and so I'm just going to kind of share three that I think we need to be considering right now within the context of, of of racism as a public health crisis. And that's first that exacerbated social determinants of health. Um, across marginalized communities is going to affect maternal health um, uh, equity in really profound ways. You know, one being that the unemployment rate is higher than, um, than it has been at any other point since the Great Depression, particularly for women of color. And you know, certainly a sudden loss of income is going to lead to things like housing instability, food insecurity, um, and these social needs are both risk factors for increased incidence of um, maternal mortality and uh, maternal morbidity, including morbidity, including things like um, gestational diabetes, hypertension, hemorrhage. Um, and also we know um, from what we've learned around the disproportionate uh, impact of COVID-19 on black communities is that black people um, are more are, are disproportionately exposed because they are holding jobs that um, are are designated as essential and therefore are at higher risk of exposure to COVID nineteen and you know certainly pregnant people are considered high risk um, you know they still have to go to work in many cases because that's the economic reality of our society. Um, we also are seeing a reduced use of and access to pre and postnatal care so. You know, certainly a lot of clinic, clinics and providers have opened their doors again, but, um, you know, there's folks who remain fearful of exposure and aren't using the clinics or, or there's other clinics that are only doing telehealth visits right now. And so I think we have to be thoughtful about how that, that, that potential to exacerbate um, inequities as people aren't getting the care that they need or they may be prolonging sort of the time between different appointments and also 
Um, the, the body of research that um, I've done in the maternal health space shows that um, relationships and building relationships under care is incredibly important for birthing people of color. And it's really difficult um, to do that in a virtual space. Um, we also know that there's high, higher levels of mistrust and distrust due um, of the healthcare system due to structural racism that certainly make it hard in a sort of telehealth or virtual setting to build, build a relationship as well. And then, you know, limited access to support systems. So, you know, our social distancing requirements are going to limit um, access to um, social support networks for birthing people. Um, also, it's going to limit access to doulas. And my research with Dr. Katie Kazimano has shown that doulas are incredibly important or that continuous labor support is incredibly important for, um, particularly for um, people who are marginalized in our, in our healthcare delivery system. So I think we have a lot to think about at the intersections of racism and maternal health and COVID-19. And we haven't, frankly, uh, scratched the surface there of um, what it's going to do to our communities. Um, the other new context, which actually is, I would say, only new for some, um, because um, certainly police violence and police brutality has been the reality and the lived experience of Black communities for a very long time. But, um, you know, I think we are thinking about it in a different um, way now, and I think it's incredibly important to understand that this within the context of um, maternal mortality and maternal and infant health as well. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to share um, something I wrote in response to um, the the killing of George Floyd and in, in our community here in the Twin Cities, um, and as it relates to uh, black mothers and reproductive health and thinking about sort of the intersections of those two. Um, and so I think I'll pause, I won't read it out loud, but I'll pause for a second for folks who are interested in, in reading that before I dig into sort of the statistics and data behind um, the points that I make here. So I'm going to um, move into some, some analyses and some data that I've been working on actually prior to George Floyd's murder, because again, this is not a new issue. It's one that we are newly, I think, grappling with, which is wonderful and important. But frankly, um, I think we would all agree that someone did another death didn't have to happen or shouldn't have had to happen for the for us to get to this point. But you know what? Um, it, so I think. I guess a year ago or so, um, the American Public Health Association named law enforcement violence or police violence um, as a public health issue. And I think that's an incredibly important point to make because prior to that, while there's you know sort of bits and pieces of scholarship that have suggested that it is a, you know police violence or police brutality is a public health issue, um, I think that statement um, has really sort of galvanized a field and a body of work in this space that is incredibly important for understanding. Um, um, uh, one way that racism is manifested in our communities and in our populations to imp and impacting um, health outcomes. So um, what we see here is that, and this is, these are data from Minneapolis. So this is the Minneapolis Police Department database. And um, these are birth data from um, one of the largest healthcare systems here in the Twin Cities. And we were really, um, you know, at a very basic level, just interested in understanding if police contact, so not even police violence, not police, um, you know, police brutality or the harming of someone, um, but simply police presence or police exposure or contact, if that um, impacted health outcomes in some way. And I think, you know, again, this is where it's important to think about the weathering hypothesis and sort of this cumulative exposure and cumulative disadvantage um, in people's lives that, you know, builds up sort of in the body and, and starts to age the body. So. What we found here is that, um, um, not probably not surprising to some of you um, listening today, that the neighborhoods in Minneapolis are uh, racially segregated, which certainly dates back to residential segregation and the history of racial covenants in Minneapolis. Um, 
if you're not familiar with the racial covenants, um, you know, Mapping Prejudice, if you Google Mapping Prejudice, they have an incredible website where you can sort of understand how um, historically how city or how homes were um, bought and who they were able, who was able to purchase them and how that sort of led to a lot of the segregation we experience here in the Twin Cities. But we see that, um, Neighborhoods with more black residents have higher um, incidence of police contact. So just on a sheer sort of just looking at the raw numbers, we see that um, black uh, neighborhoods that have more black residents are, are more policed. Um, and then we were interested in looking at preterm birth. So a birth before 37 weeks gestation. Um, we don't want babies that are born too early because um, you know, for a variety of reasons, they are um, more likely to experience infant mortality. They are more likely to, if they survive, to um, experience other health um, issues across um, childhood and and sometime even sometimes even further um, along than that. And so, what we see overall, and again, happy to dig into numbers and data at a later point, but um, generally, what we observe is an 83% increase in the odds of preterm birth. Um, for people who reside in neighborhoods where there's higher police contact or police exposure. We also, in a separate study, and this study, and I should say both of these studies are pre-George Floyd, um, and in this study, I um, was really interested in thinking about, you know, if you think about the quote that I shared with you around um, the, the word mama and how, what that meant for um, when George Floyd called out that word. And, um, you know, this, this study, we actually started um, just after Philando Castillo was shot and killed in Falcon Heights um, to understand, because we were hearing from um, black mothers and um, that that they were there was stress and um, that they their mental well being wasn't um, was was off because of um, the sort of highly publicized way that Philando Castile was killed by um, a Falcon Heights police officer and so um, we began to sort of um, do a mixed method study to and surveying folks to understand what those feelings were and are um, both qualitatively and quantitatively so these um, analyses are sort of all in progress. We just wrapped up the study um, actually the week before George Floyd was um, was killed. Um, and so we're in the process of, of really digging through this data, but I wanted to share some of it today because I think it's a really important way of um, describing sort of how police violence as a form of structural racism is manifested and operating um, in, um, in black bodies and uh, that of mothers in particular. So um, nearly you know, 70, 72% of the um, the people who responded to our survey said that they're afraid of police officers um, and that they are afraid of police violence in their communities. Um, a surprisingly large percentage of people reported knowing someone who had been harmed by the police in some way. Um, they talked a lot in the qualitative and in the interviews about um, what it's like to have a child or to be pregnant with a with a boy, and what that meant for sort of their well being, um, and what that meant for how they plan to care for and raise their child. And so, um, I think there's a lot, you know, again that we can we can unpack with this, and I'm happy to do that in the question and answer as well. Um, just doing a quick quick time check. Um, <clears throat> So I think it's also important to think about how racism and structural racism is showing up in healthcare. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, excuse me. Um, so, you know, it's certainly just as we're seeing it play out in sort of this population level and in our communities, you know, healthcare systems are part, you know, first and foremost, are part of our communities and an important space where people should feel safe and feel like they can go um, to get the care they need. And what we're seeing is that's not all, um, not necessarily what's happening. Um, and so I think the important takeaway from this slide is just that there is a really incredible study done in 2016 from the, at the University of Virginia where they, the, the researchers examined sort of the um, beliefs about uh, racism and slavery. And what she found was that uh, at least half of the physicians in her sample, and it was a pretty large sample, endorsed some sort of false beliefs and narratives about, about race and slavery. And those folks were actually also more, more likely to score sort of higher on the implicit association test, which is a test um, based out of Harvard, Project Implicit, that measures um, implicit racial bias. We also see um, these sorts of beliefs show up in um, the ways that pain, um, pain medicine is administered, even even to children. Here in 
here in the Twin Cities, there's a study that shows um, that Black children are less likely to get um, pain medicine for long bone fractures. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of, I think, examples of this. And in this, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides, this one being one of them. Other, you know, I'll, I'll say that um, there's some incredible work being done by folks like Saraswati Vedam um, and others um, out, out of UCSF as well that are looking at the mistreatment of women of color and birthing people people in the, um, in the healthcare system. Um, some of our work, um, this is a study that I conducted with Dr. Laura Atanasio, who's um, at the University of Massachusetts. And what we found is that, um, you know, people who are, act, Black women who are accessing the healthcare system um, for uh, pregnancy, childbirth, um, if they are declining care for some reason, if they decide to opt out of a procedure, um, they are more likely to report than having felt discriminated against by their providers. And so I think, you know, this is one sort of one more example of the ways that we're seeing the racism um, that Dr. Jones described sort of manifesting itself in healthcare delivery systems. And then finally, um, I'll share this uh, paper that I collaborated with colleagues from the University of Minnesota, George Mason and Harvard um, that was published recently uh, in the National Academy of Sciences, where we find that after examining 1.8 million hospital births in the state of Florida between 1992 and 2015, that newborn physician racial concordance is associated with a significant improvement in, in mortality for black infants. So um, what we, Generally, what we found is that black newborns um, are cared by, when black newborns are cared for by black physicians, the mortality penalty in the hospital um, is halved. So this has, you know, I think, well, this is not a direct example of sort of structural racism or racism at play in the healthcare system. I think this finding has some incredible um, implications for how we think about the ways that inequity and racism are manifested, um, both inside and outside of the healthcare system. Um, you know, and I think we, you know, have a lot of work to do, right, to think about sort of um, this question of, because I think what, what's come from a lot of the pushback with this, this research has been, well, these are the bad apples. These are the people who um, are individually um, doing harm. But what we're seeing is that, I mean, first of all, like 1992 to 2015 is a lot of data, right? It's a lot of births. It's a lot of doctors over a lot of, you know, period of time. And so I think it speaks to what, how we need to be thinking about and restructuring and doing better within our institutions and building institutions that are safe and equitable for, um, for everyone. And finally, um, I will just close by stating um, that, you know, I think we're in an incredible moment and I'm so grateful to be here to, um, to share my research, my work uh, with you. I've, I've been doing this for, um, for a while now. And, you know, we're in this time and in this moment where we're seeing sort of the convergence of police violence and racial inequities and COVID-19 and um, the maternal mortality crisis um, show up and sort of beginning to understand the forms of how forms of structural racism are concurrent and compounding the public health crises in our country. And we have a lot of work to do, but I think, um, you know, I've never seen this much sort of um, interest and activation and motivation um, then, um, you know, it's, it's, and so it's exciting and I think important and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of um, serving as a resource and um, supporting this important work. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hardiman, for joining us today and for sharing your research. We really appreciate your, your time and uh, your willingness to stay with us to answer questions with Dr. Jones as well. I'm going to let members know that if you have a question that you have for either Dr. Jones or Dr. Hardiman, you can use the hand raising uh, feature. And I will call on people as I see their hands being raised and as our view is changing. I know that uh, Representative Her had a question, uh, I believe one for Dr. Jones and one for Dr. Hardiman. So I'll recognize you, Representative Her. Thank you, Chair Richardson, uh, and uh, to our guests who presented today. These were amazing presentations. I wish we did have hours and hours to spend with each other. Uh, my first question is just uh, is to Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones, I was just curious, 
Um, have there been um, studies that have been done to show what the economic impact of structural racism has been, both on uh, organizations or you know, their revenues uh, for businesses and also for individuals? And the reason why I ask this is that I really have been thinking about this committee in just this past week when I was uh, closing on refinancing of my home. And uh, the, the day of the closing, um, our loan officer said, oh, there's the problem and underwriting and saying we can't close on your loan. And I said, uh, can you point to the policy and your practice or you know whatever federal regulation you're telling me that is preventing this from happening? And he said, that's just what underwriting does. And they're very rigorous. And I, I had to escalate this because in not closing the loan, I would have lost a savings of $4,400 in one month and $500 for the life of my loan, which was decades more. That ends up to being just an enormous amount of money. And, and the, uh, the end result of it was that I had to overcome my own internalized depression of what it means to be an Asian woman who causes trouble. And the more the bank looked into it, it turned out it was their fault. That uh, in their uh, interpretation of the underwriting laws, they misinterpreted it and then used that as the reason to deny me the loan in closing. And their explanation was, well, we're given a lot of leeway. And it, the minute they said that, it made me think about the fact that that is institutional racism at play, that when you have the leeway, you get to choose who gets to be a winner and who gets to be a loser. And when the when the president of that mortgage area called me back, they said, we will close on your loan today still, if you can. And I thought, what happens when you don't have the privilege of having uh, official power? You don't have mm. the privilege of language, the privilege of time to fight institutions. What does that, what is that economic cost to businesses themselves and the loss of their revenues because they would have, they're making a ton of money on me and the loss to individuals. Do we have a, a research that quantifies that? So I have to first admit that I don't know exactly where I should send you for that kind of research. I'm sure that there are, are social scientists who have done that. But as you were speaking, I think The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein sort of uh, documents um, the cumulative uh, impact of these kinds of laws in the FHA and VA and their, even the way that they um, specifically racially segregated many cities and perpetuated that. Um, I uh, entirely agree that structural racism, you know, even though I talk about three levels, you know, institutionalized or structural, and then this per personally mediated or interpersonal and internalized systems operate through people and people's actions are condoned by systems, and I very much give you an amen on the observation that discretion is often how people are able to act on their assumptions, on their differential assumptions uh, about people's abilities, motives, intents, to turn it into action is when there is discretion. So, so I think that you're right about that. All we have to do in terms of studies to do it, I think if we just look at the very well documented differences in wealth <laughs> between different populations, differences in income, you know. So, so sometimes people look at these statistics, even differences in educational outcome, and they, because we endorse this myth of meritocracy, they say, oh, it's because those people are lazy or stupid or whatever. But when I look at those data, those data themselves are the documentation that you seek. But in terms of People who are who are specifically going into it more deeply, I would say, Dr. Hardiman, what do you have to add on that? Thank you. Um, so I would just add, there's actually a great study that I put the link into um, the chat called "The Economic Benefits of Reducing Racial Disparities in Health: The Case of Minnesota." Um, uh, Dr. Myers, who is a professor in um, the Humphrey School of Public Policy is one of the lead authors on that work. Um, also, there is a study that happened far too long ago at this point um, called the Economic Burden of Health Inequalities in, in the United States that was done by um, a fantastic group of researchers, um, I believe at Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, Daryl, Ga Dr. Daryl Gaskins was one of the uh, the lead authors there, um, where they do I think a beautiful job of really quantifying the economic costs of um, black mortality in our country and what that loss actually looks like and what it means for us as a society. Um, I think it's probably time for an update, but it's certainly an incredibly important and um, you know seminal piece to um, uh, that I think will help speak to some of what you um, were asking about, Representative Her. May I just add one more thing? Those are excellent resources. I have I am sometimes hesitant 
um, in these economic analyses to put values on people's lives because the differential valuation in our inherent in our yeah. society gets reflected there. So even when you think about, uh, you know, the people who were lost on 9-11 in the World Trade Center collapses, different families got different amounts of money depending on the projected earnings of their lost loved one and which which builds structural racism into even the the valuation of people's lives so even though yes. it, all of this is very important work but i'm hesitant um to do that but maybe that's how we're going to show that racism saps the strength of the whole society maybe it's in those kinds of things but when you okay <laughs> no, that's that's fascinating and i i think that that's fascinating and i i hear you that that's not the way i would like to approach it but i also know that you know, when there's money behind a quantification of loss, it's, it almost seems like that's the only thing people will act because they see that financial loss. But I agree wholeheartedly with both you and Dr. Hardiman. And then my last question, and I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time because this issue is so important to me, but Dr. Hardiman, I just wanted to ask you really quick. I know that I, I, I embarked on this work because I was really interested. I'd heard so many things around the maternal health disparities and, you know, Black women not being believed even at their pain level threshold and not getting medication when they were in delivery. And and as I started working, I convened with a group that was from the county and the state and from groups that were working this issue. And when I asked them, I said, with well, this data, which is really great. And I'm, as I asked this question, I just want to be very clear that like, I understand the place of privilege that I get to ask this question from, right? Because, um, you know, I, uh, based on erroneous stereotypes, right? Like Asians are considered sort of like the, uh, the minorities that are the, the least scary, right? And we've been used as the wedge to, uh, to kind of, um, you know, be used against the African American community and to create this like race to the bottom. So like, I just want to be very clear that I'm very, I'm very aware and cognizant of that dynamic. And so as I ask this question, it is not a, to, uh, to perpetuate that idea of like it's a race to the bottom, but I was just want to be able to dispel the myth that, and all of this data, again, as we see in many ways in which collect data, Asian Americans are an invisible minority, right? And that I see that I, you know, very much so that the data around this is between, uh, um, does not include uh, Asian Americans. And when I asked in this large community of people, why is that the case? I was told that actually it's not even collected. And so I just want to be very clear. I uh, just want to make sure that, you know, we can have a discussion around this, knowing that there are some groups that are actually not even having data collected and that it's not because Asian women are doing so well and we're just like succeeding. It's because the data is not being collected. And that I just want people to be aware of that so that we're not going on an erroneous assumption that Asian, the Asian community, and especially our Southeast Asian community, which is very different than the East Asian community, yeah. is doing really well, and uh, maternal health disparities is not impacting them. Yeah, I think that's uh, such an important point, Representative. Thank you for, for bringing it up. And I think it also speaks to um, our struggles around, you know, sort of institutional sexism, right? The fact that these data, I mean, even the, the black maternal health data and the fact that we are just now sort of grappling with the rising maternal mortality rate, regardless of race, like speaks to the institutional um, sort of intersections of, um, of race and, and gender and sex that um, have kept that from happening, right? And so we haven't even, I think we haven't even scratched the surface um, and we have a lot of work to do, I think particularly here in Minnesota to, um, to continue to build a robust way to collect those data and to review those cases and to, um, to make sure that um, um, all, you know, everyone has a, has a fair chance at um, having a healthy, um, healthy birth and becoming a mother. You know, um, I will say that, you know, as we look at, you know, in the, the, I think the, the media has certainly highlighted over the past couple of years the um, uh, Black maternal experience um, because those numbers are so startling, right? And they're so, and they're driving right now. That is, as what we know is that that is what is driving sort of the inequities. And then when you combine that with, you know, some incredibly high profile folks who have had some really terrible experiences um, and, you know, it's, we, but yes, we, I think generally we have a lot of work to do to sort of understand the entire sort of um, scope of what we're facing. Representative Long, you had a question. I did, thank you. Um, thank you both for the outstanding presentations. I wanted to follow up on the uh, weatherization hypothesis and, and COVID uh, connection that uh, you had made, Dr. Hardiman. Um, I think we, we know the data about uh, the uh, disparities in terms of diseases like asthma and other respiratory ailments that we see in communities of color and with black children um, 
We know that there is an increased pollution burden uh, in communities of color. And I'm wondering, I know COVID is uh, a novel virus, we're just seeing it this year, but uh, what data or, or evidence is there at this point or, or even anecdotal that we can point to, to to show a linkage between the disparities we're seeing in health outcomes in COVID and the disparities that we know exist uh, for other respiratory uh, effects that these communities are, are bearing? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, thank you, Representative Long. Um, I, you know, I think everything at this point, like things are changing daily, right? When we think about sort of the, the impact of COVID. I mean, what we know right now is that certainly there's a respiratory um, impact of, you know, there's a respiratory sort of role that um, in COVID. And certainly what we're seeing in um, communities, particularly um, disinvested communities, communities that are next to sort of the the pollution and the plants that, you know, are um, where they're getting sort of toxic chemicals, that's only going to um, exacerbate to the asthma rates and the, the other respiratory outcomes that we're seeing. But I think we haven't even sort of, we, we don't know actually what, um, well, how this is going to play out in the long term. Um, I don't know, Dr. Jones, if you would add, add anything else to that. Well, certainly what we do know is that, um, Nobody was immune to the virus in December of 2019. So, and, and that we do know that if opportunity were equally distributed and exposure to risk were equally distributed, there would be no way that we could slice and dice the population right. and find these differences. So what we're seeing is, and I know your question was very specific, Representative Long, I'm, you know, it, it, um, but, but some people might think, oh, well, those people are more affected because there's something different about them biologically. Or some people might think, oh, well, they just didn't take it seriously or whatever. But, but what we're seeing is that people of color are more likely to be infected with COVID-19 because we're more exposed and less protected. And then once infected with the virus, we're more likely to die because we're more burdened by chronic diseases with less access to health care. And each of those things, the more exposed because of the frontline jobs, but also uh, more likely to be, you know, imprisoned or in jails or detention centers, uh, more likely to be in house or more exposed for a lot of things. And those things, when you drill down, why are we in the frontline jobs? Well, it's living in uh, disinvested communities that are poor and, and segregated. And when you look at the public schools there, they're poorly funded because of how we fund public schools based on local property taxes, most places. And, and then, so then you have another, you know, poor educational outcomes, another generation loss. So now the only jobs they have are the frontline jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Why are they less protected? Because even though they're now essential workers, they're not uh, highly valued, highly paid, paid sick leave, family medical leave or nothing, not even OSHA protections you know, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So all of us, and then when you get to more burdened by chronic diseases, that's to your point, Representative Long, more burdened by chronic diseases because of the conditions of lives, because of living in these uh, communities without green space, with poisoned air, poisoned water, you know, poor access to food, all of that, and then the less access to health care. So I, I say this, and I know that you must always know this, but it's, it's a, com you know, for everybody else who's listening, um, there is nothing about black and brown and indigenous people that would make them more susceptible to COVID-19 except the conditions of their lives. And I fear that we have already, that we've stopped talking about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in the same, same ways that we don't right. problematize the differences in infant mortality rates or maternal mortality rates or any of the others because we're just saying, oh, that's just a health disparity now. All of these things, not just the COVID, but all of these things have racism as their root because that's what race is measuring. This variable race is rough proxy for social class because of structural racism, rougher for culture. Each racial group has many ethnicities, as you, Representative Hare, talked about. Meaningless for genes, but precisely captures the social classification of people in our race-conscious society. All of the racial disparities that we see are due to racism, and they manifest in terms of pollution and air and asthma stuff. They manifest in terms of all of these other things. One more thing I want to say on the maternal mortality, the maternal mortality review committees now, Maria from CDC, uh, when they go and they um, examine, you know, people who've died and then they give causes, now racism is one of the causes that they can um, can mark off in their maternal mortality reviews. So this is, that's as of about this spring this yeah. year. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, Representative New. 
Thank you. And thank you both for your presentations. Um, Dr. Hardiman, I, it was going so fast, I was trying to keep up with all of your slides. But um, sort of a, a specific question about one of the slides. You had a slide that was talking about um, structural racism and sort of the relationship with different things uh, and uh, maternal mortality and how those things related to one another. And most of those items were sort of obvious and, and easy to understand and easy to connect those dots. But there was one item that I, I'm, I'm curious to understand the relationship here. It says structural relation, or excuse me, structural racism in prison incarceration rates was associated with 22% decrease in yeah. white maternal mortality. What, what what was what is that relationship act exactly? And I think I'm not putting that together as clearly as the others. Sure. Um, so just as we you know are sort of well versed in in talking about the disproportionate impact of um, you know certain of structural racism on black communities, I think it's important to note that for white communities, often there is a level of benefit that we haven't, that, that remains sort of under or unexamined. And so one of the things that we are digging into with those data is to, um, to understand sort of within these counties, within these communities, um, is it that, um, you know, white maternal uh, mortality rates stay the same and we're seeing this just, you know, that black maternal mortality is getting worse? Is it that, um, you know, white maternal mortality is getting better as black maternal mortality is getting worse. So it's sort of starting to dig into those, um, um, those, those questions um, in that piece. Sorry, I'm just going to pull up the, I don't know if it would be helpful to share the slide or share the screen. Yeah. And maybe, maybe to clarify then is, is the statistic that as, as uh, prison incarceration rates go up for black people, the maternal this is mortality right. for white women decreases 22%. Right. Is that the relationship? Exactly. And I think there's a lot that still needs to be unpacked to sort of understand what's at play within a society that would cause sort of that, that type of relationship. And we can't dig into that, unfortunately, with the, you know, with the, you know, quantitative analyses in this way, but certainly um, qualitative work that actually has some, you know, allows folks, uh, like allows conversations to be had and sort of digging into that, that lived experience, um, I think is incredibly important. And also I would say that there's, some regional pieces and geographic um, pieces to this that have to be understood. So we're looking at all of the counties across the United States that have um, that had enough a higher uh, high enough number of maternal mortal you know maternal deaths that we could actually had the power to do the analyses. But um, and so I think there's certainly some um, some geographic. I mean we've we've started to look at like the South right versus the Midwest um, or the North and um, see some regional differences. Um, we have another set of analyses that are looking at the urban versus rural differences in maternal mortality at the county level um, with respect to structural racism. And um, so I think you know we still have a lot of there's a lot more questions than answers at this point. May I ask you though, Rachel, are you able to see uh, whether I don't know how the counties were were scored, mm -hmm. but often prisons are jobs yep. in rural white areas, yes. yep. and so maybe the incarceration rate that you're looking is not the incarceration rate of those people's things. Maybe uh, the families are benefiting from the incarceration of other people from all over the country, but it's giving prison jobs. I mean, it's a prison industrial Yeah, country. that's a Maybe really that's good- That's seeing. That's a really good point, Dr. Jones. I don't, we haven't looked at that quite yet, but that, um, and I think, you know, I think one of the ways we can do that is taking that index of the concentration of extremes, the ICE measure, which looks at the sort of high versus low income, you know, index in each of these counties and look at that with respect to the um, prison um, incarceration. Um, rates. Or just the location of prisons. I mean, you don't yeah. even have to go that deep. You could just, so instead of looking at the income, just look at counties with the, where prisons are located. Yep. And, and then do some analysis there. It's very interesting yeah. work. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I'll interject here quickly, just because we've got a number of members with questions and in, in short time, uh, Representative New, it looks like you've completed your, your questions. Um, so I will move on to Representative Becker-Fenn. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my, my question's also about uh, COVID and specifically the testing. And so we've all sort of seen the stories and seen the data now on the deaths and the infectivity rates and, and uh, if that's even a word, um, uh, within our, uh, you know, Black, Brown, Indigenous, you know, Latino communities. Uh, but, but my question is, I, you know, as this sort of goes on, and we all sort of have our uh, COVID adjacent uh, things happen. Uh, you know, just to share an example, I, um, I was going to be visiting a family member who is very high risk, somebody with disability. But I haven't haven't seen that person in many many months, and so I wanted to get tested before I visited that person, and so. Um, I was able to get tested, but it was because I was able to pay $125. I had health partners insurance and uh, had been a, a patient at that, had seen one of their doctors within a certain length of time. And, you know, we also had uh, someone who had watched our kids over the summer who was exposed to somebody who had COVID. He also, you know, his, his mom had to make two dozen phone calls and drive into a specific clinic and pay a fee to get him tested. And I'm wondering if we have any information um, related to the dis the disparate impact in access to testing, because I think that has a huge impact on the behaviors of certain people and, you know, whether you're able to keep yourself safe uh, and your, your family members safe. And so I'm wondering if, if either of you, uh, either of the doctors uh, have anything to share about either what they're observing or if we're kind of paying attention to how um, these disparities are impacting access to testing specifically. Dr. Jones, would you like to start first? I don't have the numbers, so I'm sorry on that. I do know that the patterns were that testing, it's what you described, that testing centers were located in affluent areas at the beginning. They would drive up. That's not the case now, but they did require doctor's orders, so that was disproportionate. I do not have the numbers to, to say, but have heard descriptions that it remains that way. What we would be able, the way we would know would be to look at positivity rates from different neighborhoods. And so then that would tell you, is, is testing widely available enough to have comparable positivity rates in different neighborhoods by zip code or by, you know, however, and, and then you would know. But I haven't looked at those numbers and I'm not even sure um, how the positivity rates, I mean, right now it's just by states. I don't know if counties and all are reporting differential positivity rates and you can look at it, but that's how you would know. You would need to know by neighborhoods actually to have a sense. And, and, and Dr. Heidemann, did you have anything to add? Um, Thank you, uh, Representative Richardson. I um, would only add, I mean, I completely agree with what Dr. Jones said, and I don't have those those numbers either, but I agree, we need, and I don't know that the data are being collected at the level um, that's granular enough to be useful for, to answer your question, um, Representative becker -Fenn. Um, but I, I completely agree. It's a, it's a significant issue even. Um, I, my husband and I, who, my husband's a family medicine physician, I'm in public health, and we um, had to jump through quite a few hoops to get COVID tests um, about a month ago. And so I can only imagine what that experience is like for folks who don't have the same level sort of, of, of access and privilege. Um, and so I think it's, it's certainly a space that we need to be spending some more time sort of digging into um, to the data. May I just say one more thing? I know you're trying to rush us, but the president needs to invoke the Defense Production Act for test and for mask, for N95 mask. It is inexcusable. And I know you guys are a state legislature, you know, a state house. But yes, it was done for, for ventilators, but we have not invoked the Defense Production Act for mask and for PPE and for tests. Why are we as a rich nation still having a scarcity? That's right. Uh, Representative Sandow. Uh, actually, Madam Madam Chair, oh. quick follow up. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little harder Be over Zoom. Representative like Becker Fenn. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a little harder to get people's attention when you <laughs> want to want to do a little follow up. Uh, so. It, Thank you so much for those answers. And and I'm kind of thinking in the same vein because I think this is a thing. The testing is an area where we actually could take action to address this now in a way that would have a meaningful impact for community members, for the health of our communities. This isn't like, oh, look at all this bad stuff that already happened. Like, this is a thing we could take action on 
now and just sort of that recognition that apparently, you know, if you play professional sports, you have access to testing every single day, but if you go to public school, you don't. And so, um, just, I, I thank you for your answers and just want to lift up that this isn't, uh, oh, darn, we screwed that one up um, issue. I think that we should all sort of be thinking big picture and trying to figure out if this is something we can address to uh, um, work on those disparities in a meaningful way now as we continue in the pandemic. So thank you. Thank you, Representative becker uh Representative Sandell. Thanks, Chair Richardson. I um, um, I found uh, Dr. Hardman's uh, many of Dr. Hardman's um, uh, conclusions uh, disheartening. I had a question uh, similar to uh, Representative News about um, one of the issues, but the the numbers and the conclusions didn't surprise me at all. Um, but given Dr. Jones' observations and analysis, how do we go about solving these problems? The issues are in front of us. They've been here a long while. There are a lot of uh, brilliant minds that have, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, insightful politicians who have uh, uh, tried to solve some of these problems. But it's the uh, 21st century now, and our responsibility as legislators is to solve these issues. So, what's your suggestion? Dr. So, I would say that we have to. <laughs> oh, Dr. Jones, I was going to say if you could answer that in 60 seconds or less, it would be appreciated. <laughs> No problem. I was gone. I was off to the races. So I think that we have to ask the question, how is racism operating here? Looking at structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. This is going to seem a little in the sky, but structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making. Who's at the table? Who's not? What's on the agenda and what's not? So we need to expand our decision making tables. And even you all in your representative positions need to find ways to bring community members uh, at all levels of, of uh, input. If structures are the who, what, when, and where decision-making policies are the written how, practices and norms are the unwritten how, and values are the why. I have actually taken that question anytime I'm asked to do a talk. Most recently, it was about cho children of color and nature. How, you know, why is there a disparity? And I generate with that question, who, what, when, where, why, and how, ideas of levers for intervention. So that's, um, I wish I'd had more time in my presentation. I would, you know, and if you get the PowerPoint, you'll see how I break that down. But I, I would say that. Um, it's really about community engagement, if you want like a short answer. There are many people working on problems in their communities right now who don't get the airspace. They don't get the, they don't have the power, the access. And so if we can recognize those people and invest in those people and partner with those people who are already trying to solve the problems in their communities, we'll get a lot farther than thinking we can get our answers in our little tables without their voices. Representative Sandell, any follow-up? Uh, thank you, uh, um, I guess, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Richardson. Thank you. Representative Damon. Thank you, Chair Richardson. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones, for your presentation, and also Dr. Hardiman for your presentation. Very much appreciated. My question is for Dr. Hardiman. On your um, uh, slide that you had, um, police contact as a determinant of structural racism. You talked about an 83% increase in the odds of the preterm birth. Um, my question, it's two part. The first part, were there other factors for that preterm birth um, added into the 83%? So other, so I wanna make sure I understand, um, understand your question um, because uh, basically what we do or what we did in our analyses was control for those um, other factors. Um, so I'm assuming sort of the other factors you might be referring to are like access to prenatal care or um, hypertension or, you know, preeclampsia, the things that we know sort of add um, risk to um, preterm birth. Is that where you're? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we, we, we did control for as much of that as possible. Of course, there's always limitations and no sort of set of analyses in this space, um, particularly as we're you know, using um, vital statistics data and, you know, records and our electronic health records, but um, we controlled for quite a lot of things. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And then the second part is with that increase in the preterm birth, did you see additional infant mortality out of those preterm babies? So we don't have enough um, power in that data to um, look at infant mortality. Um, so while infant mortality is a horrifying and you know concerning statistic, um, we you need to have sort of a pretty large sample to be able to so look at those those trends. And so in this, we um, we looked at preterm birth and low birth weight, but we weren't able to look at infant mortality. We just didn't have the numbers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Representative Cagle, I think I saw your hand raised. 
Yeah, I I guess my question is more kind of a philosophical question. Uh, just kind of, you know, convincing people that structural racism exists. I think a lot of the data that we've seen today is really a good indicator. But I mean, you know, there's conversations that I've had just within this body um, where people are very... Um, they don't, they don't believe that there is structural racism. And so, um, you know, that's my first question. And I guess that's kind of the question we have with this committee going forward is how do we show people that there actually is structural racism out there? And then I guess my second part of my question is, you know, how do we convince people to dismantle systems that benefit them? Um, and so those are just, as we've been going through this and I've been listening and, um, listening to everybody, you know, those are the two big questions in my head, in my mind about how we move forward, um, with this really important work. And I don't expect an answer to that because <laughs> I don't, I don't know if, if, um, there is a good one yet, but if, if anybody has one, please let me know. I have some ideas. So history. So if, if, if people had to learn history of this nation or even history of your district, uh, you know, even history of your neighborhood, that would help people understand that um, what set things up. So I just want to quickly say there are seven. This is in less than a minute. There are seven um, kind of cultural uh, barriers to achieving health equity and to naming racism. One is our narrow focus on the individual in this country, which makes systems and structures invisible or irrelevant. So we have to figure out how do we address that. The second is that we as a nation are ahistorical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. The third is our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy, that if you work hard, you'll make it. Most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field. So we had to reveal that uneven playing field. The fourth is our myth of a zero sum game that if you gain, I lose that, you know, this sets us up in competition. It's almost like you think you're at a potluck dinner and you don't want somebody else to come and eat because you think they're going to eat up all the food and you don't even recognize they're bringing cakes and pies and roast and all kinds of good stuff with them. The fifth is our limited future orientation. The parts of the future we can touch right now are the children and the planet. We have a disregard for the children and uh, a usurious relationship with the planet. We do not ask, how are the children? And even if we did ask, we would not get the answer, all the children are well. We think about my children versus your children, not our children. The sixth is our myth of American exceptionalism, that we're so special, so different, so ordained by God, so we don't even learn, even in the COVID context, learn from other nations. And the seventh is white supremacist ideology, which might sound like a lightning rod term to people. I do not mean it that way. It is a description of a false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race that puts white so first there is no there is no hierarchy of human valuation by race but white supremacist ideology says there is and puts white people as the ideal or the norm that gives people who are living as white a sense of entitlement it, it results in the dehumanization of people of color and fear at the browning of america that's manifest in some of our uh, current situations so if we um, acknowledge these things as what i'm now describing as the value targets for anti-racism action four of those things make it very easy pe for people to deny racism. If you can't see systems, if you're ahistorical, if you think that if you work hard, you'll make it, and if you think that there's that white people are just better anyway, then you're going to deny racism. And when you see these the differences in housing and the differences in incarceration rates and differences in wealth, you're going to say, oh, well, not due to racism. So we have to reveal and address those, those societal barriers that are keeping us from understanding where we are. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and we're coming up on time and I want to be respectful. So um, I also recognize that not everyone might be able to stay, but if we go a couple minutes over, if you're able to stay, I would, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Um, Representative Erdahl. Yeah, you're still muted, Representative? No, there I am. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones, I was just wondering um, what do you think the impact is on, on knowledge of, of how the government works on uh, on people of color, well, certainly everyone, but um, I find that there, there's been a, uh, uh, I guess, a disregard for the relevance of, of civics education. Uh, is that important, do you think? It's extremely important for all of us. I think that in this nation, we're not investing in our children, point blank, but we're, we're creating, we're raising them to be 
consumers, not citizens. So I appreciate your observation. Well, thank you and uh, members of the, yes, thank you. And uh, members of the education committee who happen to be present today, please uh, keep those remarks in mind for a later discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. And not seeing any other hands, um, I would like to call on uh, uh, Co-Chair Moran. She had some uh, final thoughts that she'd like to share with the committee today. Well, this has been very, very, very insightful. Um, I just wanna thank Dr. Jones. Um, I need to do a one-on-one with you. And Dr. Hardiman, I need one with you too. Uh, but I just want to thank you for the wealth of information that you have shared on a very heavy subject. Uh, I just want to thank the members that you stay connected, you stayed in tune, we listen, we learn. Um, and this is just day one. This is just the very first hearing. We have some really um, uh, good hearing hearings that we are working on to put together. Next week, we're going to look at adverse childhood experiences. We'll talk about the kids. We talk about we're all products of our past. We're all, we're all products of my childhood. And we're going to see how um, average childhood experiences with racism impact who we are today and how we look at policies, practices, or procedures or not in the work that we do legislatively. And so I just want to close with, um, you know, with a little saying, as we look at the social determinants of health, as we also look at the social determinants of health and how racism impacts uh, those social determinants. Um, I'm just going to stop there. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, learning and hearing from the, the two of you. Um, and the questions were also very, very insightful. So I just want to thank everyone for just doing the basic, volunteering to be a part of this committee so that we can come out to be uh, a greater, a brighter institution that looks at how we can really work towards eliminating the huge disparities that is inundating our state. Um, yeah, so I just stop there. So thank you all. Thank you, Co-Chair uh, Moran. Um, and, I, and just in closing, I, I want to echo the thank you to everyone who uh, gave up their time today to volunteer to be a part of the committee. And also a huge thank you to Dr. Jones and Dr. Hardiman for sharing uh, all of the, the great information today. I know that you were put in the position of trying to talk about a really huge topic in a really short amount of time and that there is definitely a lot more information that is out there. And so uh, any resources that the committee receives, we'll be sure to pass those on to all committee members as well, uh, including things such as PowerPoints and articles um, as well. You know, and just in, in closing, I just wanted to say that I think an important piece of what is going to be critical to moving the needle on addressing racism, on addressing inequities, and on addressing uh, disparities is going to be about meaningful uh, community engagement. And it's going to be about community engagement that includes everyone, including those who are closest to the pain of the issue, if we are going to be very serious about uh, moving the needle on this. It is a complex uh, issue that I am looking forward to ongoing conversations on. Uh, and Representative Erdahl also looking forward to those conversations on the Education uh, Committee around uh, civics yeah. as, as well. And with that, uh, there being no other business uh, before the committee, we are adjourned. And our next hearing will be one week from today on Tuesday, September 29th, 2020 at 1 p.m. Thanks for joining us today.